Chapter 7 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus Translated by Arthur S. Way Born 13 February 1847 Died 25 December 1930 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When heaven hid his stars and dawn awoke, outspraying splendor, and night's darkness fled, then undismayed the Argives' warrior sons marched forth without the ships to meet in fight Eurypylus, save those that tarried still to render to Machaon midst the ships death dues, with Nereus, Nereus, who in grace and goodly head was like the deathless ones, yet was not strong in bodily might. The gods grant not perfection in all things to men, but evil still is blended with the good by some strange fate. To Nereus' winsome grace was linked a weakling's prowess. Yet the Greeks slighted him not, but gave him all death dues, and mourned above his grave with no less grief than for Machaon, whom they honored I for his deep wisdom as the immortal gods. One mound they swiftly heaped above these twain. Then in the plain once more did murderous war madden. The multitudinous clash and cry rose, as the shields were shattered by huge stones, were pierced with lances. So they toiled in fight. But all this while lay Polydorus, fasting in dust and groaning, leaving not his brother's tomb, and oft his heart was moved with his own hands to slay himself. And now he clutched his sword, and now amidst his herbs sought for a deadly drug, and still his friends essayed to stay his hand, and comfort him with many pleadings. But he would not cease from grieving. Yea, his hands had spilt his life there on his brother's new-made tomb. But Nestor heard thereof, and sorrowed sore in his affliction. And he came on him, as now he flung him on that woeful grave, and now was casting dust upon his head, beating his breast, and on his brother's name crying while thralls and comrades round their lord groaned, and affliction held them one and all. Then gently spake he to that stricken one, Refrain from bitter moan and deadly grief, my son. It is not a wise man's honour to wail, as doth a woman, over the fallen. Thou shalt not bring him up to light again, whose soul hath fleeted, vanishing into air, whose body fire hath raffined up, whose bones earth has received. His end was worthy his life. Endure thy sore grief, even as I endured who lost a son, slain by the hands of foes, a son not worse than thy Machaon, good with spears in battle, good in counsel. None of all the youth so loved his sire as he loved me. He died for me, yea, died to save his father yet when he was slain i did endure to taste food and to see the light well knowing that all men must tread one path hades ward and before all lies one goal death's mournful goal a mortal man must bear all joys all griefs that god vouchsafes to send made answer that heart-stricken one while still wet were his cheeks with ever-flowing tears father mine heart is bowed neath crushing grief for a brother passing wise who fostered me even as a son when to the heavens had passed our father in his arms he cradled me gladly he taught me all his healing lore we shared one table in one bed we lay we had all things in common these and love my grief cannot forget nor i desire now he is dead to see the light of life then spake the old man to that stricken one to all men fate assigns one same sad lot bereavement earth shall cover all alike albeit we tread not the same path of life and none the path he chooseth for on high good things and bad lie on the knees of gods unnumbered, indistinguishably blent. These no immortal seeth, they are veiled in mystic cloud-folds. Only fate puts
puts forth her hands thereto, nor looks at what she takes, but casts them from Olympus down to earth. This way and that they are wafted, as it were by gust of wind. The good man oft is whelmed in suffering. Wealth undeserved is heaped on the vile person. Blind is each man's life, therefore he never walketh surely. Oft he stumbleth, ever devious is his path now sloping down to sorrow, mounting now to bliss. All happy is no living man, from the beginning to the end, but still the good and evil clash. Our life is short, beseems not then in grief to live. Hope on, still hope for better days, chain not to woe thine heart. There is a saying among men, that to the heavens unperishing mount the souls of good men, and to nether darkness sink the souls of the wicked. Both to God and man, dear was thy brother, good to brother men, and son of an immortal. Sure am I that to the company of gods he shall ascend by intercession of thy sire. Then raised he that reluctant mourner up with comfortable words, and from that dark grave drew him, backward gazing oft with groans. To the ships they came, where Greeks and Trojan men had bitter travail of rekindled war. Eurypolis there, in dauntless spirit like the war-god, with mad raging spear and hands resistless, smote down hosts of foes. The earth was clogged with dead men, slain on either side. On he strode midst the corpses. Awlessly he fought, with blood bespattered hands and feet. Never a moment from grim strife he ceased. Peneleos the mighty-hearted came against him in the pitiless fray. He fell before Eurypolis' spear. Yea, many more fell round him. Seized not those destroying hands, but wrathful on the Argives still he pressed. As when of old on Philoe's long-raised heights among the centaurs, terrible Hercules rushed, storming in might, and slew them, passing swift and strong, and battle-cunning though they were. So rushed he on, and smote down the array, one after other of Danian spears, heaps upon heaps, here, there, in throngs they fell, strewn in the dust. As when a river in flood comes thundering down, banks crumble on either side to drifting sand, on seaward rolls the surge, tossing wild crest, while cliffs on every hand ring crashing echoes, as their brows break down beneath long, leaping, roaring waterfalls, and dikes are swept away. So fell in dust the war-famed Argives by Eurypolis slain, such as he overtook in that red rout. Some few escaped, whom strength of fleeing feet delivered. Yet in that sore strait they drew Peneleos from the shrieking tumult forth, and bare to the ships, though with swift feet themselves were fleeing from ghastly death and pitiless doom. Behind the rampart of the ships they fled, in huddled rout. They had no heart to stand before Eurypolis, for Hercules to crown with glory his stalwart son thrilled them with panic. There behind their wall they cowered, as goats to leeward of a hill shrink before the wild cold rushing of the wind that bringeth snow and heavy sleet and haft. No longing for the pasture tempteth them over the brow to step and face the blast, but huddling screened by rock wall and ravine they abide the storm and crop the scanty grass under dim copses thronging till the gust of that ill wind shall lull. So by their towers screened did the trembling Danians abide Telephus' mighty son. Yea, he had burnt the ships, and all that host that he destroyed, had not Athena at the last inspired the Argive men with courage. Ceaselessly from the high rampart hurled they at the foe with bitter biting darts, and slew them fast, and all the walls were splashed with reeking gore, and I went up a moan of smitten men. So fought they, night long, day long fought they on. Cetaeans, Trojans, battle-biding Greeks, fought, now before the ships, and now again round the steep wall with fury unutterable. Yet even so, for two days did they cease from murderous fight, for to Eurypolis came a Danian embassage, saying, From the war forbear we, while we give unto the flames the battle-slain. So hearkened he to them, from ruinous reeking strife forbore the host, 
and so their dead they buried, who in dust had fallen. Chiefly the Achaeans mourned Peneleos. O'er the mighty dead they heaped a barrow broad and high, a sign for men of days to be. But in a several place the multitude of heroes slain they laid, mourning with stricken hearts. On one great pyre they burnt them all, and buried in one grave. So likewise, far from thence, the sons of Troy buried their slain. Yet murderous strife slept not, but roused again Eurypylus' dauntless might to meet the foe. He turned not from the ships, but there abode, and fanned the fury of war. Meanwhile the black ships on to Skyros ran, and those twain found before his palace gate Achilles' son, now hurling dart and lance, now in his chariot driving fleet-foot steeds. Glad were they to behold him practising the deeds of war, albeit his heart was sad for his slain sire, of whom had tidings come ere this. With reverent eyes of awe they went to meet him, for that goodly form and face seemed even as Achilles unto them. But he, or ever they had spoken, cried, all hail, ye strangers, unto this mine house. Say whence ye are, and who, and what the need that hither brings you over barren seas. So spake he, and Odysseus answered him, Friends are we of Achilles, lord of war, to whom of Diadamia thou wast born. Yea, when we look on thee, we seem to see that hero's self, and like the immortal ones was he. Of Ithaca am I, this man of Argos, Nurse of horses, if perchance thou hast heard the name of Tydeus' warrior's son, or of the wise Odysseus. Lo, I stand before thee, sent by voice of prophecy. I pray thee, pity us. Come thou to Troy and help us. Only so unto the war an end shall be. Gifts beyond words to thee the Achaean king shall give. Yea, I myself will give to thee thy godlike father's arms, and great shall be thy joy in bearing them, for these be like no mortal's battle gear, but splendid as the very war god's arms. Over their marvellous blazonry hath gold been lavished. Yea, in heaven Hephaestus self rejoiced in fashioning that work divine, the which thine eyes shall marvel to behold. For earth and heaven and sea upon the shield are wrought, and in its wondrous compass are creatures that seem to live and move. A wonder even to the immortals. Never hath man seen their like, nor any man hath worn, save thy sire only, whom the Achaeans all honoured as Zeus himself. I chiefliest from mine heart loved him, and when he was slain, to many a foe I dealt a ruthless doom, and through them all bare back to the ships his course. Therefore his glorious arms did Thetis give to me. These, though I prize them well, to thee I will gladly give when thou comest to Troy. Yea, also, when we have smitten Priam's towns and unto Hellas in our ships return, shall Menelaus give thee, and thou wilt, his princess child to wife for love of thee, and with his bright-haired daughter shall bestow rich dower of gold and treasure, even all that meet is to attend a wealthy king. So spake he, and replied Achilles' son, if bidden of oracles the Achaean men summon me, let us with tomorrow's dawn fare forth upon the broad depths of the sea, if so to longing Danians I may prove a light of help. Now pass we to mine halls, and to such guest fare as befits to set before the stranger. For my marriage day, to this the gods in time to come shall see. To the forecourt when they came of that great mansion, found they there the queen Diadamia, in her soul of sorrow grief wasted. As when snow from mountainsides before the sun and east wind wastes away, so pined she for that princely hero slain. Then came to her amidst her grief the kings, and greeted her in courteous wise. Her son drew near, and told their lineage and their names. But that for which they came he left untold until the morrow lest unto her woe there should be added grief and floods of tears, and lest her prayers should hold him from the path whereon his heart was set. Straight feasted these, and comforted their hearts with sleep, even all which dwelt in sea-ringed Skyros. 
Night long lulled by long low thunder of the girdling deep, Of waves Aegean breaking on her shores. But not on thee, Adamia, fell the hands of kindly sleep. She bore in mind the names of crafty Odysseus, And of Diomed the godlike, How these twain had widowed her of battle fain Achilles, How their words had won his aweless heart to fare with them, To meet the war-cry where stern fate met him, Shattered his hope of home return, And laid measureless grief on Peleus and on her. Therefore an awful dread oppressed her soul, Lest her son too to tumult of war should speed, And grief be added to her grief. Dawn climbed the wide-arched heaven, Straightway they rose from their beds, Then Diadamia knew, And on her son's broad breast she cast herself, And bitterly wailed. Her crying thrilled through the air, As when a cow loud lowing mid the hills Seeks through the glens her calf, And all round echo long ridges of mountain steep. So on all sides, from dim recesses, Rang the hall, and in her misery she cried, Child, wherefore is thy soul on the wing To follow strangers unto Ilium, The fount of tears, where perish many in fight, Yea, cunning men in war and battle grim? And thou art but a youth, and hast not learned The ways of war, which save men in the day of peril. Hearken thou to me, abide here in thine home, Lest evil tidings come from Troy unto my ears, That thou in fight hast perished, for mine heart saith, Never thou hitherward shalt from battle toil return. Not even thy sire escaped the doom of death. He, mightier than thou, mightier than all heroes on earth, Yea, and a goddess son, but was in battle slain. All through the wiles and crafty counsels of these very men, Who now to woeful war be kindling thee. Therefore mine heart is full of shuddering fear, Lest, son, my lot should be to live bereaved of thee, And to endure dishonour and pain. For never heavier blow on woman falls Than when her lord hath perished, And her sons die also, And her house is left her desolate. Straightway evil men remove her landmarks, Yea, and rob her of all, Setting the right at naught. There is no lot more woeful, and more helpless than is hers, who is left a widow in a desolate home. Loud wailing spake she, but her son replied, Be of good cheer, my mother. Put from thee evil foreboding. No man in war is beyond his destiny slain. If my weird be to die in my country's cause, then let me die when I have done deeds worthy of my sire. Then to his side old Lycomedes came, And to his battle-eager grandson spake, O valiant-hearted son, so like thy sire, I know thee strong and valorous, Yet, O oh, yet for thee I fear the bitter war, I fear the terrible sea surge. Shipmen evermore hang on destruction's brink, Beware, my child, perils of water When thou sailest back from Troy on other shores, Such as beset full oft times the voyagers That ride the long sea ridges, when the sun hath left the archer star and meets the misty goat, when the wild blasts drive on the lowering storm, or when Orion to the darkling west slopes into ocean's river sinking low. Beware the time of equal days and nights, when blasts that o'er the sea's abysses rush, none knoweth whence, in fury of battle clash. Beware the Pleiades setting, when the sea maddens beneath their power, nor these alone, but other stars, Terrors of hapless men, as o'er the wide sea gulf they set or rise. Then kissed he him, nor sought to stay the feet of him who panted for the clamour of war, who smiled for pleasure and for eagerness to haste to the ship. Yet were his hurrying feet stayed by his mother's pleading, and her tears still in those halls awhile. As some swift horses reined in by his rider, when he strains unto the race-course, and he neighs and champs the curving bit, Dashing his chest with foam, and his eager feet for the course are still never, His restless hooves are clattering eye, his mane is a stormy cloud, He tosses high his head with snortings, and his lord is glad. So reigned his mother back the glorious son of battle-stay Achilles, 
so his feet were restless so the mother's loving pride joyed in her son despite her heart-sick pain a thousand times he kissed her then at last left her alone with her own grief and moan there in her father's halls as o'er her nest a swallow in her anguish cries aloud for her lost nestlings which mid piteous shrieks a fearful serpent hath devoured and wrung the mother's loving heart and now above the empty cradle spreads her wings and now flies round its porchway fashioned cunningly lamenting piteously her little ones so for her child the adamia mourned now on her son's bed did she cast herself crying aloud against his doorpost now she leaned and wept now laid she in her lap those childhood toys yet treasured in her bower wherein his babe heart joyed long years agone she saw a dart there left behind of him and kissed it o'er and o'er yea whatso else her weeping eyes beheld that was her son's not heard he of her moans unutterable but was afar fast striding to the ship he seemed as his feet swiftly bare him on like some all radiant star and at his side with tidiest son war wise odysseus went and with them twenty gallant-hearted men who diadamia chose as trustiest of all her household and unto her son gave them for henchmen swift to do his will and these attended achilles valiant son as through the city to the ships he sped on with glad laughter in their midst he strode and thetis and the nereids joyed thereat yea glad was even the raven-haired lord of all the sea beholding that brave son of princely achilles marking how he longed for battle beardless boy albeit he was his prowess and his might were inward spurs to him he hastened forth his fatherland like to the war-god when to gory strife he speedeth wroth with foes when maddeneth his heart and grim his frown is and his eyes flash levin flame around him and his face is clothed with glory of beauty terrible as on he rusheth quell the very gods so seemed achilles goodly son and prayers went up through all the city unto heaven to bring their noble prince safe back from war and the gods hearkened to them high he towered above the stateliest men which followed him so they came to the heavy plunging sea and found the rowers in the smooth wrought ship handling the tackle fixing mast and sail straightway they went aboard the shipmen cast the hawsers loose and heaved the anchor stones the strength and stay of ships in time of need then did the sea queen's lord grant voyage fair to these with gracious mind for his heart yearned o'er the achaeans by the trojan men and mighty souled eurypylus hard bestead on either side of neoptolemus sat those heroes gladdening his soul with tales of his sire's mighty deeds of all he wrought in sea raids and in valiant telephus land and how he smote round priam's burg the men of troy for glory unto atreus sons his heart glowed fain to grasp his heritage his aweless father's honour and renown in her bower sorrowing for her son the while the adamia poured forth sighs and tears with agony of soul her very heart melted in her as over coal doth lead or wax and never did her moaning cease as o'er the wide sea her gaze followed him i for her son a mother fretted still though it be to a feast he hath gone by a friend bidden forth but soon the sail of that good ship far fleeting o'er the blue grew faint and fainter melted in sea haze but still she sighed still day long made her moan on ran the ship before a following wind seeming to skim the myriad surging sea and crash the dark wave either side the prow swiftly across the abyss unplumbed she sped night's darkness fell about her but the breeze held and the steersman's hand was sure o'er gulfs of brine she flew till dawn divine rose up to climb the sky then sighted they the peaks of Ida, Chrysa next, and Samynthius' fame, then the Sigean strand, and then the tomb of Aeacus' son. Yet would Laertes' seed, the man discreet of soul, not pointed out to Neoptolemus, lest the tide of grief too high should swell within his breast. 
They passed Calydna's isles, left Tenedos behind, And now was seen the fane of Ilius, Where stands Protesilaus' tomb Beneath the shade of Taucry elms, When soaring high above the plain Their topmost boughs discern Troy, Straightway wither all their highest sprays. Nigh Ilium now the ship by wind and oar was brought. They saw the long strand, fringed with keels of Argives, who endured sore travail of war, even then about the wall, the which themselves had reared to screen the ships and men in stress of battle. Even now Eurypylus' hands to earth were like to dash it and destroy. But the quick eyes of Tydeus' strong son marked how rained the darts and stones along that long wall. Forth of the ship he sprang, and shouted loud with all the strength of his undaunted breast, Friends, on the Argive men is heaped this day sore travail. Let us don our flashing arms with speed, and to yon battle turmoil haste. For now upon our towers the warrior sons of Troy press hard. Nay, our souls shall fall before our due time, and shall lie in graves of Troyland, far from children and from wives. As one man down from the ship they leapt, for trembling seized on all for that grim sight, on all save all this Neoptolemus, whose might was like his father's, lust for war swept o'er him. To Odysseus' tent in haste they sped, for close it lay to where the ship touched land. About its walls there hung great store of change of armor, of wise Odysseus some, and rescued some from gallant comrades slain. Then did the brave men put on goodly arms, but they in whose breast faintlier beat their hearts must don the worser. Odysseus stood arrayed in those which came with him from Ithaca. To Diomed he gave fair battle gear, stripped in time past from mighty Socus slain. But in his father's arms Achilles' son clad him, and lo, he seemed Achilles' self. Light on his limbs and lapping close they lay, so cunning was Hephaestus' workmanship which for another had been a giant's arms. The massive helmet cumbered not his brows, yea, the great Pelian spear-shaft burdened not his hand, but lightly swung he up on high the heavy and tall lance, thirsting still for blood. Of many Argives which beheld him then, might none draw nigh to him, how fain soe'er, so fast were they in that grim grapple locked with the wild war that raged all down the wall. But as when shipmen under a desolate isle mid the wide sea by stress of weather bound chafe while afar from men the adverse blast prison them many a day they pace the deck with sinking hearts while scantlier grows their store of food they weary till a fair wind sings so joyed the archaean host which theretofore were heavy of heart when neoptolemus came joyed in the hope of breathing space from toil then like the aweless lions flashed his eyes which mid the mountains leaps in furious mood to meet the hunters that draw nigh his cave thinking to steal his cubs there left alone in the dark shadowed glen but for the height the beast hath spied and on the spoilers leaps with grim jaws terribly roaring even so that glorious child of aeacus all this sudden against the trojan warriors burned in wrath thither his eagle swoop descended first while loudest from the plain uproared the fight. There weakest he divined must be the wall, the battlements lowest, since the surge of foes break heaviest there. Charged at his side the rest, breathing the battle spirit. There they found Eurypylus, mighty of heart, and all his men, scaling a tower, exultant, in hope of tearing down the walls, of slaughtering the Argives in one holocaust. No mind the gods had to accomplish their desire. But now Odysseus, Diomed the strong, Leontius and Neoptolemus, as a god in strength and beauty, held their javelins down and thrust them from the wall. As dogs and shepherds by shouting and hard fighting drive away strong lions from a steading, rushing forth from all sides, and the brutes with glaring eyes pace to and fro, with savage lusts for blood of calves and kind their jaws are slavering. Yet must their onrush give back from the hounds and fearless onset of the shepherd folk, so from these new defenders shrank the foe a little, as far as one may hurl a stone exceeding great. For still Eurypylus suffered them not to flee far from the ships, but cheered them on to buy the brunt, till the ships be won, and all the Argives slain. For Zeus with measureless might thrilled all his frame. Then seized he a rugged stone and huge, 
and leapt and hurled it full against the high-built wall it crashed terribly boomed that rampart steep to its foundations terror gripped the greeks as though the wall had crumbled down in dust yet from the deadly conflict flinched they not but stood fast like to jackals or to wolves bold robbers of the sheep when mid the hills hunter and hound would drive them forth their caves being grimly purposed there to slay their whelps yet these albeit tormented by the darts flee not but for their cubs sake bide and fight so for the ship's sake they abode and fought and for their own lives but eurypylus a front of all the ships stood taunting them coward and dastard souls no darts of yours had given me pause nor thrust back from your ships had not your rampart stayed mine onset rush ye are like to dogs that in the forest flinch before a lion sulking there within ye are fighting nay are shrinking back from death but if ye dare come forth on trojan ground as once when ye were eager for the fray none shall from the ghastly death deliver you slain by my hand ye all shall lie in dust so did he shout a prophecy unfulfilled nor heard doom's chariot wheels fast rolling near bearing swift death at neoptolemus hands nor saw death gleaming from his glittering spear ay and that hero paused not now from fight but from the rampart smote the trojans eye from that death leaping from above they quelled in tumult round eurypylus deadly fear gripped all their hearts as little children cower about a father's knees when thunder of zeus crashes from cloud to cloud when all the air shudders and groans so did the sons of troy with those Cetaeans round their great king cower ever as prince neoptolemus hurled for death rode upon all he cast and bare his wrath straight rushing down upon the heads of foes now in their hearts those wildered trojans said that once more they beheld achilles self gigantic in his armour yet they hid that horror in their breast lest panic fear should pass from them to the Cetaean host and king eurypylus on every side they wavered twixt the stress of their hearts straight and that blood-curdling dread took shame and fear as when men treading a precipitous path look up and see adown the mountain slope a torrent rushing on them thundering down the rocks and dare not meet its clamorous flood but hurry shuddering on with death in sight holding as not the perils of the path so stayed the trojans spite of their desire to flee the imminent death that waited them beneath the wall god like your ripples i cheered them on to fight he trusted still that this new mighty foe would weary at last with toil of slaughter but he wearied not that desperate battle travail pallas saw and left the halls of heaven incense sweet and flew on mountain crest her hurrying feet touched not the earth borne by the air divine in form of cloud wreaths swifter than the wind she came to troy she stayed her feet upon sigium's windy ness she looked forth thence over the ringing battle of dauntless men and gave the achaeans glory achilles son beyond the rest was filled with valour and strength which win renown for men in whom they meet peerless was he in both the blood of zeus gave strength to his father's valour was he heir so by those towers he smote down many a foe and as a fisher on the darkling sea to lure the fish to their destruction takes within his boat the strength of fire his breath kibbles it to a flame till round the boat glareth its splendour and from the black sea dart up the fish all eager to behold the radiance for the last time for the barbs of his three-pointed spear as up they leap slay them his heart rejoices o'er the prey so that war-king achilles glorious son slew host of onward rushing foes around that wall of stone well fought the achaeans all here there adown the ramparts rang again the wide strand the ships the battered walls groaned ever men with weary ache of toil fainted on either side sinews and might of strong men were unstrung but o'er the son of battle stay achilles weariness crept not his battle-eager spirit high was tireless never touched by palsying fear he fought on as with the triumphant strength of an ever-flowing river though it rolled twixt blazing forest though the maddening blast rolls stormy seas of flame it feareth not for at its brink faint grows the fervent heat 
the strong flood turns its might to impotence. So weariness nor fear could bow the knees of hero Achilles' gallant-hearted son. Still as he fought, still cheered his comrades on. Of myriad shafts sped at him, none might touch his flesh, but even as snowflakes on a rock fell vainly ever. Holy screened was he by broad shield and strong helmet, gifts of a god. In these exulting did the Achaean son stride along the wall, with ringing shouts, cheering the dauntless Argives to the fray, being their mightiest far, bearing a soul insatiate of the awful onset cry, burning with one strong purpose to avenge his father's death. The Myrmidons and their king exulted, roared the battle round the wall. Two sons he slew of Megas, rich in gold, Sion of Damas, sons of high renown, cunning to hurl the dart, to drive the steed in war, and deftly cast the lance afar. Born at one birth beside Sancarius' banks, a periboia to him, Celtus one, and Eubius the other. But not long his boundless wealth enjoyed they, for the fates spanned them a thread of life exceeding brief. As on one day they saw the light, they died on one day by the same hand. To the heart of one, Neoptolemus sped a javelin, one he smote down with a massy stone that crashed through his strong helmet, shattered all its ridge, and dashed his brains to earth. Around them fell foes many, a host untold. The war god's work waxed ever mightier till the even tide, till fell the light celestial. Then the host of brave Eurypylus from the ships drew back a little. They that held those leaguered towers had a short breathing space. The sons of Troy had respite from deadly choking strife from that hard rampart battle. Verily, all the Argives had beside their ships been slain, had not Achilles' strong son on that day withstood the host of foes and their great chief Eurypylus. Came to that young hero's side Phoenix the old, and marvelling gazed on the image of Pleiades. Tides of joy and grief swept o'er him. Grief for memories of that swift-footed father, joy for sight of such a son. He for sheer gladness wept, for never without tears the tribes of men live, nay, not mid the transports of delight. He clasped him round as father claspeth son, whom, after long and troublous wanderings, the gods bring home to gladden a father's heart. So kissed he Neoptolemus' head and breast, clasping him round, and cried in rapture of joy, Hail, goodly son of that Achilles, whom I nursed a little one, in mine own arms with a glad heart. By heaven's high providence like a strong sapling waxed he in his stature fast, and daily I rejoiced to see his form and prowess, my life's blessing, honouring him as though he were the son of mine old age, for like a father did he honour me. I was indeed his father, he my son, in spirit, thou hadst deemed us of one blood who were in heart one, but of nobler mould was he by far, in form and strength a god. Thou art wholly like him, yea, I seem to see alive amid the Argives him for whom sharp anguish shrouds me ever. I waste away in sorrowful age. Oh, that the grave had closed on me while yet he lived! How blessed to be by loving hands of kinsmen laid to rest. Ah, child, my sorrowing heart will never more forget him. Chide me not for this my grief. But now help thou the Myrmidons and Greeks in their sore strait. Wreck on thy foe thy wrath for thy brave sire. It shall be thy renown to slay this war insatiate Telephus' son, for mighty art thou, and shalt prove than he, as was thy father than his wretched sire. Made answer, golden-haired Achilles' son, Ancient are battle prowers mighty fate, and the o'ermastering war-god shall decide. But as he spake, he had fain on that same day forth of the gates have rushed in his sire's arms. But night, which bringeth men release from toil, rose from ocean veiled in sable pall. With honour, as of mighty Achilles' self, him mid the ships the glad Greeks hailed, who had won courage from his eager rush to war. 
with princely presents did they honour him with priceless gifts whereby his wealth increased for some gave gold and silver handmade some brass without weight gave these and iron those others in deep jars brought the ruddy wine yea fleet-foot steeds they gave and battle-gear and raiment woven fair by women's hands glowed neoptolemus heart for joy of these a feast they made for him amidst the tents and there extolled achilles godlike son with praise as the immortal heavenly ones and joyful voiced agamemnon spake to him thou verily art the brave-souled achaean son his very image thou in stalwart might in beauty stature courage and in soul my heart burns in me seeing thee i trust thine hands and spear shall smite yon host of foes shall smite the city of priam world renowned so like thy sire thou art methinks i see himself beside the ships as when his shout of wrath for dead patroclus shook the ranks of troy but he is with the immortal ones yet bending from that heaven sends thee to-day to save the argives on destruction's brink answered achilles battle-eager son would i might meet him living yet o king that so himself might see the son of his love not shaming his great father's name i trust so it shall be if the gods grant me life so spake he in wisdom and modesty and all there marvelled at the godlike man but when with meat and wine their hearts were filled then rose achilles battle-eager son and from the feast passed forth unto the tent that was his sire's much armour of heroes slain lay there and here and there were captive maids arraying that tent widowed of its lord as though its king lived when that son beheld those trojan arms and handmade thralls he groaned by passionate longing for his father seized as when through dense oak groves and tangled glens comes to the shadowed cave a lion's whelp whose grim sire by the hunters hath been slain and looketh all around that empty den and seeth heaps of bones of steeds and kine slain theretofore and grieveth for his sire even so the heart of brave pleiades son with grief was numbed the handmaids marvelling gazed and fair briseis self when she beheld achilles son was now right glad at heart and sorrowed now with memories of the dead her soul was wildered all as though indeed there stood the aweless aeacid living yet meanwhile exultant trojans camped aloof extolled eurypylus the fierce and strong as erst they had praised hector when he smote their foes defending troy and all her wealth but when sweet sleep stole over mortal men the sons of troy and battle-biding greeks all slumber heavy slept unsentineled end of chapter seven chapter eight of the fall of troy by smyrnanius quintus translated by arthur s way born 13 February 1847, died 25 December 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When from the far sea line, where is the cave of dawn, rose up the sun, and scattered light over the earth, then did the eager sons of Troy and of Archaea arm themselves, a thirst for battle. These Achilles' sudden cheered on to face the Trojans awlessly, and those the giant strength of telephus seed kindled he trusted to dash down the wall to earth and utterly destroy the ships with ravening fire and slay the argive host ah but his hope was as the morning breeze delusive hard beside him stood the fates laughing to scorn his vain imaginings then to the myrmidon spake achilles son the aulus to fight in kindling them hear me mine henchmen Take ye to your heart the spirit of war, that we may heal the wounds of Argos, and be ruined to her foes. Let no man fear, 
for mighty prowess is the child of courage but fear slayeth strength and spirit gird yourselves with strength for war give foes no breathing space that they may say that mid our ranks achilles liveth yet then clad he in his father's flashing arms his shoulders then exulted Thetis' heart from the sea when she saw the mighty strength of her son's son then forth with eagle spread afront that high wall he rushed his car drawn by the immortal horses of his sire as from the ocean verge upsprings the sun in glory flashing fire far over earth fire when beside his radiant chariot team races the red star sirius scatterer of wofulest diseases over men so flashed upon the eyes of ilium's host that battle-eager hero achilles son onward they whirled him those immortal steeds the which when now he longed to chase the foe back from the ships automedon who wont to rein them for his father brought to him with joy that pair bore battleward their lord so like to aeacus son their deathless hearts held him no worser than achilles self laughing for glee the argives gathered round the might resistless of neoptolemus eager for fight as wasp whose woodland bower the axe hath shaken who dart swarming forth furious to sting the woodmen round their nest long eddying they torment all passers-by so streamed they forth from galley and from wall burning for fight and that wide space was thronged and all the plain far blazed with armour sheen as shone from heaven's vault the sun thereon as flees the cloud-rack through the welkin wide scourged onward by the north wind's titan blast when winter tide and snow are hard at hand and darkness overpalls the firmament so with the thronging squadrons was the earth covered before the ships to heaven uprolled dust hung on hovering wings men's armour clashed rattled a thousand chariots horses neighed on rushing to the fray each warrior's prowess kindled him with its trumpet call to war as leaped the long sea rollers onward hurled by two winds terribly o'er the broad sea flood roaring from viewless bournes with whirlwind blast crashing together when a ruining storm maddens along the wide gulfs of the deep and moans the sea queen with her anguished waves which sweep from every hand up towering like precipice mountains while the bitter squall ceaselessly veering shrieks across the sea so clashed in strife those hosts from either hand with mad rage strife incarnate spurred them on and their own prowess crashed together these like thunder clouds out lightning thrilling the air with shattering trumpet challenge when the blasts are locked in frenzied wrestle with mad breath rending the clouds when zeus is wroth with men who travail with iniquity and flout his law so grappled they as spear with spear clashed shield with shield and man on man was hurled and first Achilles' war impetuous son struck out stout Menelaus and Alcidamus, sons of the warlord Alexinomus, who dwelt in Carnas' mountain cradled, nigh the clear lake shining at Terbellus' feet, neat snow capped Imbrus. Venus, fleet foot son of King Cassandra, slew he, born to him by fair Creusa, where the lovely streams of Lindris meet the sea, beside the marches of battle biding Carians, and the heights of Lycia, the renowned. He slew with all Maurice the spearman, who from Phrygia came. Polybus and Hippomedion by his side he laid, this stabbed to the heart, that pierced between shoulder and neck. Man after man he slew. Earth groaned neath Trojan corpses, rank on rank crumbled before him, even as parts break sink down before the blast of ravening fire when the north wind of latter summer blows, so ruining squadrons fell before his charge. Meanwhile, Aeneas slew Aristocles, crashing a great stone down on his head. It break helmet and skull together, and fled his life. Fleetfoot Eumaios Diomed slew. He dwelt in craggy darkness, where the bride bed is, whereon Anchises clasped the queen of love. Agamemnon smote down Stratus. Unto Thrace returned he not from war, but died far off from his dear fatherland. And Moronis struck Clemnus down, Piacinor's son, the friend of godlike Glaucus and his comrade Leal, who by Laramus' outfall dwelt, the folk honoured him as their king, when reigned no more Glaucus in battle slain. 
all who abode around Phoenice's towers, and by the crest of Massatitis and Camara's glen. So man slew man in fight, but more than all Eurypolis hurled doom on many a foe. First he slew battle by the Eurytus, Menotius of the glancing taslet next, Elephino's godlike comrades. Fell these with Harpalus, wise Odysseus' warrior friend. But in the fight afar that hero toiled, and might not aid his fallen henchmen. Yet fierce Antiphus for that slain man was wroth, and hurled his spear against Eurypolis, yet touched him not. The strong shaft glanced aside, and pierced Melanion, battle staunch, the son of Cleate, lovely faced, Euralus' bride, who bare him where Caiacus meets the sea. Wroth for his comrade slain, Eurypolis rushed upon Antiphus, but terror winged he plunged amid his comrades. So the spear of the avenger slew him not, whose doom was one day wretchedly to be devoured by the man slaying Cyclops. So it pleased stern fate, I know not why. Else whither sped Eurypolis, and I, as he rushed on, fell neath his spear a multitude untold. As tall trees smitten by the strength of steel in mountain forest fill the dark ravines heaped on the earth confusedly, so fell the Achaeans neath Eurypolis' flying spears, till, heart uplifted, met him face to face, Achilles' son. The long spears in their hands they twain swung up, each hot to smite his foe. But first Eurypolis cried the challenge cry. Who art thou? Whence hast come to brave me here? To Hades merciless fate is bearing thee, For in grim fight hath none escaped mine hands. But whoso, eager for the fray, have come hither, On all have I hurled anguished death. By Xanthus streams have dogs devoured their flesh, And gnawed their bones. Answer me, who art thou? Whose be the steeds that bear thee exultant on? Answer Achilles' battle-eager son, Wherefore, when I am hurrying to the fray, thus thou, a foe, put question thus to me, as might a friend, touching my lineage, which many know. Achilles' son am I, son of the man whose long spear smote thy sire, and made him flee. Yea, and the ruthless fates of death had seized him, but my father's self healed him upon the brink of woeful death. The steeds which bear me were my godlike sires, these the west wind begat, the harpy bear. Over the barren sea their feet can race, skimming its crest. In speed they match the winds. Since then thou knowest the lineage of my steeds and mine, now put thou to the test the might of my strong spear. Born on steep Pilion's crest, who hath left his father's stock and forest there. He spake, and from the chariot sprang to earth that glorious man, he swung the long spear up, but in his brawny hand his foe hath seized a monstrous stone. Full at the golden shield of Neoptolemus he sped its flight. But no whit staggered by its whirlwind rush, he like a giant mountain foreland stood, which all the banded fury of river floods cannot stir, rooted in the eternal hills. So stood unshaken still Achilles' son. Yet not for this Eurypolis' dauntless might shrank from Achilles' son invincible spurred on by his own hardihood and by fate. Their hearts like cauldrons seethed o'er the fires of wrath. Their glancing armor flashed about their limbs. Like terrible lions each on other rushed, which fight amid the mountains famine stung, writhing and leaping in the strain of strife for a slain ox or stag. While all the glens ring with their conflict, so they grappled, so clashed they in pitiless strife. On either hand long lines of warriors, Greek and Trojan toiled in combat. Round them roared up the flames of war. Like mighty rushing winds they hurled together, with eager spears for blood of life athirst. Hard by them stood Eno, spurred them on ceaselessly. Never paused they from the strife. Now hewed they each other's shield, and now thrust at the greaves, now at the crested helms. Reckless of wounds in that grim toil pressed on those aweless heroes. Strife incarnate watched and gloated o'er them. Ran the sweat in streams from either. Straining hard they stood their ground, For both were of the seed of blessed ones. From heaven, with hearts at variance, God looked down, For some gave glory to Achilles' son, Some to Eurypolis the godlike. Still on they fought, Giving ground no more than rock, Of granite mountains. 
rang from side to side spear smitten shields. At last the Pelian lance, sped onward by a mighty thrust, hath passed clear through your riverless throat. Forth bore the blood, torrent like. Through the portal of the wound, the soul from the body flew. Darkness of death dropped o'er his eyes. To earth in clanging arms he fell, like stately pine or silver fir uprooted by the fury of Boreas. Such space of earth Eurypylus' giant frame covered in falling. Rang again the floor and plains of Troyland. Grey death pallor swept over the corpse, and all the flush of life faded away. With a triumphant laugh shouted the mighty hero over him. Eurypylus, thou saidst thou wouldst destroy the Danian ships and men, would slay us all wretchedly, but the gods would not fulfil thy wish. For all thy might invincible, my father's massy spear hath now subdued thee under me. That spear no man shall scape, though he be brass all through, who faceth me. He spake, and tore the long lance from the course, while shrank the Trojans back in dread at sight of that strong-hearted man. Straightway he stripped the armor from the dead, for friends to bear fast to the ships Achaean. But himself to the swift chariot and tireless steed sprang, and sped onward like a thunderbolt, that lightning girded, leaped through the wide air from Zeus's hand unconquerable, the bolt before whose downrush all the immortals quell, save only Zeus. It rusheth down to earth, it rendeth trees and rugged mountain tops. So rushed he on the Trojans, flashing doom before their eyes. Dashed to the earth they fell before the charge of those immortal steeds. The earth was heaped with slain, was dyed with gore. As when in mountain glens the unnumbered leaves downstreaming thick and fast hide all the ground, so host of Troy untold on earth was strewn by Neoptolemus and fierce-hearted Greeks, shed by whose hands the blood in torrents ran neath the feet of men and horses. Chariot rails were dashed with blood spray, whirling up from the tires. Now had the Trojans fled within their gates as calves that flee a lion, or as swine flee a storm. But murderous Ares came, unmarked of other gods, down from the heavens, eager to help the warrior sons of Troy. Red fire and flame, tumult and panic fear his car steeds, bear him down into the fight, the coursers which to roaring Boreas grim-eyed Arenes bear, coursers that breathe light blasting flame groaned all the shivering air as battleward they sped. Swiftly he came to Troy. Loud rang the earth beneath the feet of that wild team. Into the battle's heart, tossing his massy spear, he came. With a shout he cheered the Trojans on to face the foe. They heard and marveled at that wondrous cry, not seeing the gods' immortal form, nor steeds, veiled in dense mist. But the wise prophet soul of Hellenus knew the voice divine that leapt unto the Trojans' ears. They knew not whence, and with glad heart to the fleeing host he cried, O cravens, wherefore fear Achilles' son, though ne'er so brave? He is mortal, even as we. His strength is not as Ares' strength, who was come a very present help in our sore need. That was his shout, far peeling, bidding us to fight on against the Argives. Let your hearts be strong, O friends. Let courage fill your breast. No mightier battle helper can draw nigh to Troy than he. Who is of more avail for war than Ares when he aideth men hard fighting? Lo, to our help he cometh now. On to the fight! Cast to the winds your fears! They fled no more. They faced the Argive men as hounds that mid the copses fled at first, then turned them about to face and fight the wolf, spurred on by the chiding of their shepherd lord. So turned the sons of Troy again to war, Casting away their fear, man leapt on man, valiantly fighting, loud their armor clasped, smitten with swords, with lances, and with darts. Spears plunged into men's flesh, tread Ares drank his full of blood, struck down fell man on man, as Greek and Trojan fought. In level poise the battle balance hung, as when men in hot haste prune a vineyard with the steel, and each keeps pace with each in rivalry since all in strength and age be equal matched. So did the awful scales of battle hang level. All Trojan hearts beat high, and firm stood they in trust on aweless Ares' might, while the Greeks trusted in Achilles' son. 
ever they slew and slew stalked through the midst deadly eno her shoulders and her hands blood splashed a fearful sweat streamed from her limbs reveling in equal fight she aided none lest thetis or the war god's wrath be stirred then neoptolemus slew one far renowned perimedes who had dwelt by simintheus grove next cestros died Phalaris battle staunch perilasus the strong Penelcus, lord of spears whom ever anasia bare by the haunted foot of scylla to the cunning craftsman medon in the homeland afar his sire abode and never kissed his son's returning head for that fair home and all his cunning works did far-off kinsmen wrangle o'er his grave david beslew lycon battle staunch the lance had pierced him close above the groin and round the long spear all his bowels gushed out aeneas smote down timus who erewhile in aulis dwelt and followed into troy arcesilaus and saw never more the dear homeland euryalus hurled a dart and through as the ray as breast the death-winged point flew shearing through the breathways of man's life and all that lay within was trenched with blood and hard thereby great solagenor slew hippomenes hero terse's comrade staunch with one swift thrust twixt shoulder and neck his soul rushed forth in blood death's night swept over him grief for his comrade slain on terse fell he strained his bow a swift wing shaft he sped but smote him not for lightly agenor swerved yet nigh him diaphontes stood the shaft into his left eye plunged passed through the ball and out through his right ear because the fates whither they will thrust on the bitter barbs even as in agony he leapt full height yet once again the archer's arrow hissed it pierced his throat through the neck sinews cleft unswerving and his hard doom came on him so man to man dealt death and joyed the fates and doom and fell strife in her maddened glee shouted aloud and ares terribly shouted in answer and with courage thrilled the trojans and with panic fear the greeks and shook their reeling squadrons but one man he scared not even achilles son he abode and fought undaunted slaying foes on foes as when a young lad sweeps his hand around flies swarming over milk and nigh the bowl here and there they lie struck dead by that light touch and gleefully the child still plies the work so stern achilles glorious scion joyed over the slain and recked not of the god who spurred the trojans on man after man tasted his vengeance of their charging host even as a giant mountain peak withstands on rushing hurricane blast so he abode unquailing ares at his eager mood grew wroth and would have cast his veil of cloud away and met him face to face in fight but now athena from olympus swooped to forest mantled ida Clink the earth and xanthus murmuring streams so mightily she shook them terror stricken were the souls of all the nymphs a dread for priam's town from her immortal armour flashed round hovering lightnings fearful serpents breathed fire from her shield invincible the crest of her great helmet swept the clouds and now she was at point to close in sudden fight with ares but the mighty will of zeus daunted them both from high heaven thundering his terrors Ares drew back from the war, for manifest to him was Zeus's wrath. To wintry Thrace he passed, his haughty heart reeked no more of the Trojans. In the plain of Troy no more stayed Pallas, she was gone to hallowed Athens. But the army still strove in the deadly fray, and fainted now the Trojans' prowess. But all battle fain the Argives pressed on these as they gave ground as winds chase ships that fly with straining sails on to the outsea as on the forest breaks leapeth the fury of flame as swift hounds drive deer through the mountains eager for the prey so did the argives chase them achilles son still cheered them on still slew with that great spear whom so he overtook on on they fled till into stately gated troy they poured then had the argives a short breathing space from war when they had penned the host of Troy in Priam's burg, as shepherds pen up lambs upon a lonely steading, as when after hard strain a breathing space is given to oxen that, quick panting neath the yoke, up a steep hill have dragged a load, so breathed awhile the Achaeans after toil in arms. 
Then once more hot for the fray did they beset the city towers. But now with gates fast barred the Trojans from the walls withstood the assault, as when within their steading shepherd folk abide the lowering tempest, when a day of storm hath dawned, with fury of lightnings, rain, and heavy drifting snow, and dare not haste forth to the pasture, howsoever fain, till the great storm abate, and rivers wide with rushing floods again be passable, so trembling on their walls they abode the rage of foes against their ramparts surging fast. And as when daws or starlings drop in clouds down upon an orchard close, full fain to feast upon its pleasant fruits, and take no heed of men that shout to scare them thence away, until the reckless hunger be appeased that makes them bold, so poured round Priam's burg the furious Danians. Against the gates they hurled themselves, they strove to batter down the mighty-souled earth-shaker's work divine. Yet did the Troy folk not, despite their fear, flinch from the fight. They manned their towers, they toiled unresting. Ever from the fair-built walls leapt arrows, stones, and fleet-winged javelins down amidst the thronging foes. For Phoebus thrilled their souls with steadfast hardihood. Fain was he to save them still, though Hector was no more. Then Mariona shot with a deadly shaft, and smote Philodemus, Polyta's friend beneath the jaw. The arrow pierced his throat. Down fell he, like a vulture from rock by Fowler's barbed arrow shot and slain. So from the high tower swiftly down he fell. His life fled, clanged his armor o'er the corpse. With laughter of triumph stalwart Molus son a second arrow sped, with strong desire to smite Polites, ill-starred Priam's son. But with the deadly side swerve did he escape the death, nor did the arrow touch his flesh. As when a shipman, as his bark flies on o'er sea gulfs, spies amid the rushing tiny rock, and to escape it swiftly puts the helm about, and turns aside the ship even as he listeth, that a little strength averts a great disaster, so did he foresee and shun the deadly shaft of doom. Ever they fought on, walls, towers, battlements were blood besprent, wherever Trojans fell, slain by the arrows of the stalwart Greeks. Yet these escaped not scatheless, many of them died the earth red. I waxed the havoc of death, as friends and foes were stricken, or the strife shouted for glee Eno, sister of war. Now had the Argives burst the gates, had breached the walls of Troy, for boundless was their might. But Ganymedes saw from heaven, and cried, anguished with fear for his own fatherland. O oh, father Zeus, if of thy seed I am, if at thine hest I left far famous Troy for immortality with deathless gods, hear me now, whose soul is anguish thrilled. I cannot bear to see my father's town in flames, my kindred in disastrous strife perishing. Bitterer sorrow is there none. Oh, if thine heart is fixed to do this thing, let me be far hence. Less shall be mine grief if I behold it not with these mine eyes. That is the depth of horror and of shame to see one's country wrecked by hands of foes. With groans and tears so pleaded Ganymede. Then Zeus himself with one vast pall of cloud veiled all the city of Priam world-renowned and all the murderous fight was drowned in mist, and like a vanished phantom was the wall, in vapours heavy hung no eye could pierce. And all around crashing thunders, lightnings flamed from heaven. The Danians heard Zeus' clarion peal, awestruck, and nearly a son cried unto them, Far famous lords of Argives, all our strength palsied shall be, while Zeus protecteth thus our foes. A great tide of calamity on us is rolling. Haste we then to the ships. Cease we awhile from bitter toil of strife, lest the fire of his wrath consume us all. Submit we to his portents. Needs must all obey him ever, who is mightier far than all strong gods, all weakling sons of men. On the presumptuous titans once in wrath he poured down fire from heaven, then burned all earth beneath, and ocean's world engulfing flood boiled from its depths, yea, to its utmost bounds. Far-flowing mighty rivers were dried up, perished all broods of life-sustaining earth, all fosterlings of the boundless sea, and all dwellers in the rivers. Smoke and ashes veiled the air. Earth fainted in the fervent heat. 
Therefore this day I dread the might of Zeus. Now pass we to the ships, since for to-day he helpeth Troy. To us too shall he grant glory hereafter. For the dawn on men, though whiles it frown, anon shall smile. Not yet, but soon shall fate lead us to smite yon town. If true indeed was Calchas' prophecy, spoken aforetime to the assembled Greeks, that in the tenth year Priam's burg should fall. Then left they that far famous town, and turned from war, in awe of Zeus's threatenings, hearkening to one with ancient wisdom wise. Yet they forgot not friends in battle slain, but bare them from the field and buried them. These the mist hid not, but the town alone, and its unscalable wall, around which fell Trojans and Argives many in battle slain. So came they to the ships, and put from them their battle gear, and strode into the waves of Hellespont, fair flowing, and washed away all stain of dust and sweat, and clotted gore. The sun drave down his never-wearying steeds into the dark west. Night streamed o'er the earth, bidding men to cease from toil. The Argives then acclaimed Achilles' valiant son with praise, high as his father's. Mid triumphant mirth he feasted in king's tents. No battle toil had wearied him. For Thetis from his limbs had charmed all ache of travail, making him as one whom labor had no power to tire. When his strong heart was satisfied with meat, he passed to his father's tent, and over him sleep's dews were poured. The Greeks slept in the plain before the ships, by ever-changing guards watched, for they dreaded, lest the host of Troy, or of her staunch allies, should kindle flame upon the ships and from them all cut off their home return. In Priam's burg the while, by gate and wall, men watched and slept in turn, a dread to hear the Argives' onset shout. End of chapter 8《Translated by Arthur S. Way. Born 13 February 1847. Died 25 December 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When ended was night's darkness, and the dawn rose from the world's verge, and the wide air glowed with splendor, then did Argos' warrior sons gaze o'er the plain, and lo, all cloudless clear stood Ilium's towers. The marvel of yesterday seemed a strange dream. No thought the Trojans had of standing forth to fight without the wall. A great fear held them thralls. The awful thought that yet alive was Peleus' glorious son. But to the king of heaven Antenor cried, Zeus, lord of Ida in the starry sky, hearken to my prayer. O oh, turn back from our town that battle-eager murderous-hearted man, be he Achilles, who hath not passed down to Hades, or some other like to him. For now in heaven descended Priam's burg, by thousands of her people perishing. No respite cometh from calamity. Murder and havoc evermore increase. O father Zeus, thou carest not, though we be slaughtered of our foes. Thou helpest them, forgetting thy son, godlike darkness. But if this be the purpose of thine heart, that Argive shall destroy us wretchedly, now do it, draw not out our agony. In passionate prayer he cried, and Zeus from heaven hearkened, and hastened on the end of all, which else he had delayed. He granted him this awful boon, that myriads of Troy's sons should with their children perish. But that prayer he granted not, to turn Achilles' son back from the wide wayed town. Nay, all the more he enkindled him to war, for he would now give grace and glory to the Nered queen. So purposed he, of all gods the mightiest. But now between the city and the Hellespont were Greeks and Trojans, burning men and steeds in battle slain, while paused the murderous strife. For Priam sent his herald Menotius forth to Agamemnon and the Achaean chiefs, asking a truce wherein to burn the dead. And they, of reverence for the slain, gave ear, for wrath pursueth not the dead. And when they had lain their slain on those close thronging pyres, then did the Argives to their tents return, and unto Priam's gold-abounding halls the Trojans, 
for Eurypylus sorrowing sore. For even as Priam's sons they honoured him. Therefore, apart from all the other slain, before the gate Dardinian, where the streams of Eddie and Xanthos down from Ida flow, fed by the veins of heaven, they buried him. Aulus Achilles' son the while went forth to his sire's huge tomb. Outpouring tears, he kissed the tall memorial pillar of the dead, and groaning clasped it round, and thus he cried, Hail, father, though beneath the earth thou lie in Hades' halls, I shall forget thee not. Oh, to have met thee living mid the host! Then of each other had our souls had joy, then of her wealth had we spoiled Ilium, but now... Thou hast not seen thy child, nor I seen thee, who yearn to look on thee in life. Yet, though thou be afar amidst the dead, thy spear, thy son, have made thy foes to quail. And Danians, with exceeding joy, behold, one like to thee in stature, fame, and deeds. He spake, and wiped the hot tears from his face, and to his father's ships passed swiftly thence. With him went Myrmidon warriors two and ten, and white-haired phoenix followed on these, woefully sighing for the glorious dead. Night rose o'er earth, the stars flashed out in heaven, so these break red and slept till woke the dawn. Then the Greeks donned their armor, flashed afar its splendor up to the very firmament, forth of the gates in one great throng they poured, like snowflakes thick and fast, which drift adown heavily from the clouds in winter's cold, so streamed they forth before the wall, and rose their dread shout, groaned the deep earth beneath their tramp. The Trojans heard that shout, and saw the host, and marvelled. Crushed with fear were all their hearts foreboding doom, for like a huge cloud seemed that throng of foes, with clashing arms they came. Volume and vast the dust rose beneath their feet. Then either did some god with hardihood thrill the Iphibus heart, and make it void of fear, or his own spirit spurred him on to fight to drive with thrust of spear that terrible host of foemen from the city of his birth. So there in Troy he cried with heartening speech, O oh, friends, be stout of heart to play the men. Remember all the agonies that war brings in the end to them that yield to foes. Ye wrestle not for Alexander alone, nor Helen, but for home, for your own lives, for wives, for little ones, for parents gray, for all the grace of life, for all ye have, for this dear land. Oh, may she shroud me o'er, slain in battle, ere I see her lie neath foemen's spears. My country! I know not a bitterer pang than this for hapless men. Oh, be ye strong for battle! Forth to fight with me, and thrust this horror far away. Think not Achilles liveth still to war against us. Him the ravening fire consumed. Some other Archaean was it who so late enkindled them to war. O oh, shame it were if men who fight for fatherland should fear Achilles' self, or any Greek beside. Let us not flinch from war toil. Have we not endured much battle travail hitheretofore? What? Know ye not that to men sorely tried prosperity and joyance follow toil? So, after scourging winds and ruining storm, Zeus brings to men a morn of balmy air. After disease, new strength comes. After war, peace. All things know time's changeless law of change. Then, all eager for war, they armed themselves in haste. All through the town rang clangor of arms, as for grim fight strong men arrayed their limbs. Here stood a wife, shuddering with dread of war, yet piling as she wept her husband's arms before his feet. There little children brought to a father his war gear with eager haste. And now his heart was wrung to hear their sobs, and now he smiled on those small ministers, and stronger waxed his heart's resolve to fight to the last gasp for these, the near and dear. Yonder again, with hands that had not lost old cunning, a grey father for the fray girded a son, and murmured once and again, Dear boy, yield thou to no man in the war, and showed his son the old scars on his breast, proud memories of fights fought long ago. So when they all stood mailed in battle gear, forth of the gates they poured all eager souls for war. Against the chariots of the Greeks, their chariots charged. Their ranks of footmen pressed to meet the footmen of the foe. The earth rang to the tramp of onset, pealed the cheer from man to man, swift closed the fronts of war. Loud clashed their arms all round. From either side war cries were mingled in one awful roar. Swift-winged full many a dart and arrow flew from host to host. 
Loud clang the smitten shield neath thrusting spears, neath javelin point and sword. Men hewed with axes lightning down, crimson armor ran with the blood of men. And all this while Troy's wives and daughters watched from high walls that grim battle of the strong. All trembled as they prayed for husbands, sons, and brothers, white-haired sires amidst them sat and gazed, while anguished fear for sons devoured their hearts. But Helen in her bower abode amidst her maids, there held by utter shame. So without pause before the wall they fought, while death exulted o'er them, deadly strife shrieked out a long wild cry from host to host. With blood of slain men dust became red mire. Here, there, fast fell the warriors mid the fray. Then slew to Iphibus the charioteer of Nestor. Hippos' son, from that high car, down fell he amidst the dead. Fear seized his lord, lest, while his hands were cumbered with the reins, he too by Priam's strong son might be slain. Melanthius marked his plight. Swift he sprang upon the car. He urged the horses on, shaking the reins, goading them with his spear, seeing the scourge was lost. But Priam's son left these, and plunged amid a throng of foes. For there upon many he brought the day of doom. For like a ruining tempest on he stormed through reeling ranks. His mighty hand struck down foes numberless. The plain was heaped with dead. As when a woodman on the long ridged hills plunges amid the forest deeps, and hews with might and main, and fells sap laden trees to make him store of charcoal for the heaps of billets over turfed, and set afire, the trunks on all sides fallen strew the slopes, while o'er his work the man exulteth. So before Deiphobus' swift death dealing hands, in heaps the Achaeans each on other fell. The charging lines of Troy swept over some, some fled to Xanthus' stream. Deiphobus chased into the flood yet more, and slew and slew. As when on fish abounding Hellespont's strand, the fishermen hard straining drag a net forth of the depths to land, but while it trails yet through the sea, one leaps amid the waves, grasping at hand the sinuous headed spear to deal the swordfish death, and here and there, fast as he meets them, slays them, and with blood the waves are reddened. So were Xanthos streams empurpled by his hands, and choked with dead, yet not without sore loss the Trojans fought. For all this while Pleiades' fierce heart son of other ranks made havoc. Thetis gazed rejoicing at her son's son with a joy as great as was her grief for Achilles slain. For a great host beneath his spear were hurled down to the dust, steeds, warriors slaughter blent. And still he chased, and still he slew. He smote Hermades, war renowned, who on his steed bore down on him, but of his horsemanship small profit won. The bright spear pierced him through, from navel unto spine, and all his bowels gushed out, and deadly doom laid hold on him, even as he fell beside his horse's feet. Ascanius and Oenops next he slew. Under the fifth rib of one he drave his spear, the other stabbed he neath the throat, where a wound bringeth surest doom to man. Whom so he met besides he slew, the names what man could tell of all that day of Neoptolemus died. Never his limbs waxed weary, as some brawny laborer, with strong hands toiling in a fruitful field the live-long day, rains down to earth the fruit of olives, swiftly beating with his pole, and with the downfall covers all the ground, so fast fell neath his hands the thronging foe. Elsewhere did Agamemnon, Tydeus' son, and other chieftains of the Danians toil with fury in the fight, yet never quell the mighty men of Troy. With heart and soul they also fought, and ever stayed from flight such as gave back. But many heeded not their chiefs, but fled, towered by the Achaeans' might. Now at last Achilles' strong son marked how fast besides commander's outfall Greeks were perishing. Those Troyward fleeing foes whom he had followed slaying left he now, and bade Automedon thither drive, where hosts were falling of the Achaeans. Straightway he hearkened, and scourged the steeds immortal on to that wild fray. Bearing their lord, they flew swiftly o'er the battle highways paved with death. As Ares' chariot borne to murderous war fares forth, and round his onrush quakes the ground, while on the gods' breasts clash celestial arms out flashing fire, so charged Achilles' son against the Iphibus. Clouds of dust upsoared about his horse's feet. Automedon marked the Trojan chief and knew him. To his lord straightway he named that hero war renowned. My king, this is the Iphibus array, the man who from thy father fled in fear. Some god or fiend with courage fills him now. Nought answered Neoptolemus, save to bid drive on the steeds yet faster. 
that with speed he might have heard grim death from perishing friends. But when to each other now nigh full they drew, the Iphibus, despite his battle lust, stayed, as a ravening fire stays when he beats water. He marvelled, seeing Achilles' steeds and that gigantic son, huge as his sire, and his heart wavered, choosing now to flee, and now to face that hero, man to man. As when a mountain boar from his young brood chases the jackals, then a lion leaps from hidden ambush into view. The boar halts in his furious onset, loath to advance, loath to retreat, while foam his jaws about his wetted tusk. So halted Priam's son's car steeds and car, perplexed, while quivered his hands about the lance. Shouted Achilles' son, Ho, Priam's son, why thus so mad to smite those weaker Argives, who have feared thy wrath, and fled thine onset, so thou deemest thyself far mightiest, if thine heart be brave indeed, of my spear now make trial in the strife. On rushed he, as a lion against a stag, borne by the steed and chariot of his sire. And now full soon his lance had slain his foe, him and his charioteer, but Phoebus poured a dense cloud round him from the viewless heights of heaven, and snatched him from the deadly fray, and set him down in Troy, amid the rout of fleeing Trojans. So did Peleus' son stab but empty air, and loud he cried, Dog, thou hast escaped my wrath. No might of thine save thee, though ne'er so fain. Some god cast night's veil o'er thee, and snatched thee from thy death. Then Cronos' son dispersed that dense dark cloud, mist like it thinned and vanished into air. Straightway the plain and all the land were seen. Then far away about the Scaean gate he saw the Trojans, Seeming like his sire, he sped against them. They at his coming quelled. As shipmen tremble when a wild wave bears down on their bark, wind heaved until it swings broad, mountain high above them, when the sea is mad with tempest. So, as on he came, terror clad all those Trojans as a cloak. The while he shouted, cheering on his men, Here, friends, fill full your hearts with dauntless courage. The strength that well beseemeth mighty men Who thirst to win them glorious victory, To win renown from battle's tumult. Come, brave hearts, now strive we even beyond our strength Till we smite Troy's proud city, Till we win our heart's desire. Foul shame it were to abide long deedless here And strengthless, womanlike. Ere I be called war blencher, let me die. Then unto Ares' work their spirits flamed, down on the Trojans charged they, yea, and these fought with high courage, round their city now, and now from wall and gate towers, never lulled the rage of war, while Trojan hearts were hot to hurl the foemen back, and the strong Greeks to smite the town. Grim havoc compassed all. Then, eager for the Trojans' help, swooped down out of Olympus, cloaked about with clouds, the son of Leto. Mighty rushing winds bare him in golden armor clad, and gleamed with lightning splendor of his descent the long highways of air. His quiver clashed, loud rang the welkin. The earth re-echoed as he set his tireless feet by Xanthos, pealed his shout dreadly, with courage filling them of Troy, scaring their foes from biding the red fray. But of all this the mighty shaker of the earth was where he breathed into the fainting Greeks' fierce valor, and the fight waxed murderous through those immortals' clashing wills. Then died hosts numberless on either side. In wrath, Apollo thought to smite Achilles' son in the same place where erst he smote his sire. But birds of boding screamed to left to stay his mood, and other signs from heaven were sent. Yet was his wrath not minded to obey these portents. Swiftly drew Earthshaker nigh in mist celestial cloaked. About his feet quaked the dark earth as came the sea-king on. Then, to stay Phoebus' hand, he cried to him, Refrain thy wrath, Achilles' giant son slay not. Olympus' lord himself shall be wroth for his death, And bitter grief shall light on me and all the sea-gods, As erstwhile for Achilles' sake. Nay, get thee back to heights celestial, Lest thou kindle me to wrath, And so I cleave a sudden chasm in earth, And Ilium and all her walls go down to darkness. Thine own soul were vexed thereat. Then, overawed by the brother of his sire, And fearing for Troy's fate and for her folk, To heaven went back Apollo, to the sea Poseidon. 
but the sons of men fought on and slew and strife incarnate gloating watched at last by calchas counsel achaea's sons drew back to the ships and put them from the thought of battle seeing it was not foreordained that ilium should fall into the might of war-wise philoctetes came to aid the achaean host this had the prophet learned from birds of prosperous omen or had read in hearts of victims wise in prophecy lore was he and like a god knew things to be trusting in him the sons of atreus stayed awhile the war and unto lemnos land of stately mansions they sent tydeus son and battle staunch odysseus over sea fast by the fire god city sped they on over the broad flood of the aegean sea to vine-clad lemnos where in far-off days the wives wreaked murderous vengeance on their lords in fierce wrath that they gave them not their due but couched beside the handmade thralls of thrace the captives of their spears when they had laid waste the land of warrior thracians then these wives their hearts with fiery jealousies fever filled murdered in every home with merciless hands their husbands no compassion would they show to their own wedded lords such madness shakes the hearts of man or woman when it burns with jealousy's fever stung by torturing pangs so with souls filled with desperate hardihood in one night did they slaughter all their lords and on a widowed nation rose the sun to hallowed lemnos came those heroes twain they marked the rocky cave where lay the son of princely poias horror came on them when they beheld the hero of their quest groaning with bitter pangs on the hard earth lying with many feathers round him strewn and others round his body rudely sewn into a cloak a screen from winter's cold for oft as famine stung him would he shoot the shaft that missed no foul his aim had doomed their flesh he ate their feathers vestured him and there lay herbs and healing leaves the which spread on his deadly wound assuaged its pangs while tangled elf locks hung about his head he seemed a wild beast that hath set its foot prowling by night upon a hidden trap and so hath been constrained in agony to bite with fierce teeth through the prisoned limb ere it could win back to its cave and there in hunger and torturing pains it languisheth so in that wide cave suffering crushed the man and all his frame was wasted not but skin covered his bones unwashen there he crouched with famine haggard cheeks with sunken eyes glaring his misery neath cavernous brows never his groaning ceased for evermore the ulcerous black wound eating to the bone festered with thrills of agonizing pain as when a beetling cliff by seething seas i buffeted is carved and underscooped for all its stubborn strength by tireless waves till scourged by winds and lashed by tempest flails the sea into deep caves hath gnawed its base so great beneath his foot grew evermore the festering wound dealt when the envenomed fangs tear him of that fell water snake which men say dealeth ghastly wounds incurable when the hot sun hath parched it as it crawls over the sands and so that mightiest man lay faint and wasted his cureless pain and from the ulcerous wound i streamed to earth fetid corruption fouling all the floor of that wide cave a marvel to be heard of men unborn beside his stony bed lay a long quiver full of arrows some for hunting some to smite his foes withal with deadly venom of that fell water snake with ease besmeared before it nigh to his hand lay the great bow with curving tips of horn wrought by the mighty hands of hercules now when that solitary spied these twain draw nigh to his cave he sprang to his bow he laid the deadly arrow on the string for now fierce memory of his wrongs awoke against these who had left him years agone in pain groaning on the desolate seashore yet and his heart's stern will had he swiftly wrought but even as upon that godlike twain he gazed athena caused his bitter wrath to melt away then drew they nigh to him with looks of sad compassion and sat down on either hand beside him in the cave and of his deadly wound and grievous pangs asked and he told them all his sufferings and they spake hope and comfort and they said thy woeful wound thine anguish shall be healed if thou but come with us to achaea's host 
the host that now is sorrowing after thee with all its kings, and no man of them all was cause of thine affliction, but the fates, the cruel ones, whom none that walk the earth escape. But I, they visit hapless men unseen, and day by day with pitiless hearts, now they afflict men, now again exalt to honour. None knows why. For all the woes and all the joys of men do these devise after their pleasure. Hearkening he sat to Odysseus and to godlike Diomede, and all the hoarded wrath for olden wrongs, and all the torturing rage melted away. Straight to the strand dull thundering, and the ship, laughing for joy, they bare him with his bow. There washed they all his body in that foul wound with sponges, and with plenteous water bathed. So was his soul refreshed. Then hastened they, and made meat ready for the famished man, and in the galley supped with him. Then came the balmy night, and sleep slid down on them. Till rose the dawn they tarried by the strand of sea-girt Lemnos, but with the day-spring cast the hawsers loose, and heaved the anchor-stones out of the deep. Athena sent a breeze, blowing behind the galley taper-proud. They strained the sail with either stern-sheet taut. See where they pointed the stout girded ship, or the broad flood she leapt before the wind, broken to right and left the dark wave's side, and seething all around was hoary foam, while thronging dolphins raced on either hand, flashing along the paths of silver sea. Full soon to fish fraught Hellespont they came, and the far stretching ships. Glad were the Greeks to see the longed for faces. Forth the ships with joy they stepped. And Peoeus' valiant son on those two heroes leaned thin, wasted hands, who bare him painfully halting to the shore, staying his weight upon their brawny arms. As seems mid mountain breaks an oak or pine by strength of woodcutter half hewn through, which for a little stands on what was left of smooth trunk by him who hewed thereat hard by the roots, that its slow smouldering wood might yield him pitch. Now, like one in pain, it groans, in weakness borne down by the wind. It is upstayed upon its leafy boughs, which from the earth bear up its helpless weight. So by pain unendurable bowed down, he leaned on those brave heroes, and was borne unto the war-host. Men beheld, and all compassionated that great archer, crushed by anguish of his hurt. But one drew near, Podalirius, godlike in his power to heal. Swifter than thought he made him whole and sound, for deftly on the womb he spread his salves, calling on his physician father's name. And soon the Achaeans shouted all for joy, all praising with one voice Asclepius' son. Lovingly they bathed him, and with oil anointed. All his heaviness of cheer and misery vanished by the immortal's will, and glad at heart were all that looked on him. And from affliction he awoke to joy. Over the bloodless face the flush of health glowed, and for wretched weakness mighty strength thrilled through him goodly and great waxed all his limbs as when a field of corn revives again which erst had drooped by rains of ruining storm down beaten flat but by warm summer winds requickened o'er the laboured land it smiles so philoctetus erstwhile wasted frame was all requickened in the galley's hold he seemed to have left all cares that crushed his soul and atreus sons beheld him marvelling as one re-risen from the dead, it seemed the works of hands immortal. And indeed, so it was verily, as their hearts divined. For t'was the glorious Trito born that shed stature and grace upon him. Suddenly he seemed as when of old mid Argive men he stood, before calamity struck him down. Then unto wealthy Agamemnon's tent did all their mightiest men bring Peoeus' son, and set him chief in honour at the feast, extolling him. When all with meat and drink were filled, spake Agamemnon, lord of spears, Dear friend, since by the will of heaven our souls were once perverted, That in sea-girt Lemnos we left thee, harbour not within thine heart fierce wrath for this. By the blessed gods constrained we did it, and, I trow, the immortals will to bring much evil on us bereft of thee, Who art of all men skilfulest to quell with shafts of death all foes that face thee in fight. For all the tangled paths of human life by land and sea Are by the will of fate hid from our eyes, In many and devious tracks are cleft apart, In wandering mazes lost. 
Along them men by fortune's dooming drift Like unto leaves that drive before the wind. Oft on an evil path the good man's feet stumble, The brave finds not a prosperous path, And none of earth-born men can shun the fates, And of his own will none can choose his way. So then doth it behoove the wise of heart, Though on a troublous track the winds of fate sweep him away, To suffer and be strong. Since we were blinded then, and erred herein, With rich gifts will we make amends to thee hereafter, When we take the stately towers of Troy. But now receive thou handmaidens seven, Fleet steeds two score, victors in a chariot race, And tripods twelve, wherein thine heart may joy Through all thy days, and always in my tent Shall royal honour at the feast be thine. He spake, and gave the hero those fair gifts. Then answered Poeas, mighty-hearted son, Friend, I forgive thee freely, And all beside who so against me haply hath transgressed. I know how good men's minds sometimes be warped. Nor meet is it that one be obdurate ever, And nurse mean rancors. Sternest wrath must yield anon unto the melting mood. Now pass we to our rest, For better is sleep than feasting late For him who longs to fight. He spake, and rose, and came to his comrade's tent. Then swiftly for their war pain king they dight the couch, while laughed their hearts for very joy. Gladly he laid him down to sleep till dawn. So passed the night divine, till flushed the hills in the sun's light, and men awoke to toil. Then all athirst for war, the Argive men gan wet the spear smooth shafted, or the dart, or javelin, and they break the bread of dawn, and foddered all their horses. Then to thee spake Peoeas' son with battle-kindling speech, Up, let us make ready for the war. Let no man linger mid the galleys, ere the glorious walls of Ilium's stately tower be shattered, and her palaces be burned. Then at his words each heart and spirit glowed. They donned their armor, they grasped their shields. Forth of the ships in one huge mass they poured, arrayed in bullhide bucklers, ashen spears, and gallant-crested helms. Through all their ranks shoulder to shoulder they marched. Thou hadst seen no gap twixt man and man as on they charged. So close they thronged, so dense was their array. End of chapter 9